The worst serial killers in history are the most evil, far worse than even the likes of the notorious individuals such as Jeffrey Dahmer. As crime scene investigators can attest, the worst serial killers of all time often barely make history, although the evidence they leave behind is more dark and disturbing than any crime story we can ever imagine. Number 5 a nun given the nickname Mother Rasputin has been called one of history's most prolific serial killers of all time. This evil individual is believed to be responsible for taking 177 lives in the 1930s and 40s, though hundreds more have passed away under her orders. Miriam Ciola Codas was not a typical serial killer, but rather far worse. Jeffrey Dahmer, for example, would select one person at a time to obsess over. Instead, she used religion and the fear of tuberculosis to lure nearly anyone to her monastery, where they faced the most evil serial killer in history. Ciola Codis was born in 1893 in Karatea, a town near Athens. Like many in the region, she was poor while working on a farm and in a factory until her mid-twenties. She would begin life as a nun in the mainstream Greek Orthodox Church, and soon joined a monastery with the newly formed New Calendarists in 1927. By 1939, she was in full control of the compound and ready to unleash a most evil path of carnage. For the next 19 years, the budding serial killer sent agents to seek wealthy victims to convert. She also advertised free health care for those with tuberculosis. This plan simply consisted of fresh air at the High Altitude Monastery, which was far from an effective way to combat TB, but it worked to attract unsuspecting people to extort. Innocent newcomers were isolated from the outside world and forced to fast, often without sleep, until they volunteered to give up any land and valuable possessions. Anyone who refused was subjected to unspeakable horrors and neglect. People living in the nearby village would hear screams and moans by night. It wasn't until 1950 that the alarm was raised when the daughter of one of Siolakotis' victims became concerned over her mother's sudden forfeiture of all her possessions to the church. A police raid on the monastery made a dark and disturbing discovery. Inside were elderly women chained up in windowless rooms countless malnourished and sickly individuals, and the bodies found of hundreds of missing people who succumbed to her notorious cruelty. Ciola Codis faced three trials for her horrific actions. She was found guilty of fraud, embezzlement, abduction, and most evil of all, taking the lives of seven people. She passed away in prison and is believed to be responsible for at least 27 people another 150 people pass due to negligence. Together, it makes her one of the most evil serial killers of all time. Number 4 Between 1979 and 1981, a twisted serial killer took the lives of more than half a dozen people along popular hiking spots around the Santa Cruz Mountains and Martin County in California. The infamous serial killer would earn the nickname the Trailside Killer, a very scary person who targeted mostly women enjoying the Northern Californian outdoors. Most individuals were chosen at random, which only made this person even worse and more terrifying with every passing case. In August of 1979, a woman named Ada Kane is believed to be the serial killer's first victim. The hiker was near San Francisco when she was forced to her knees and done away with via a single round. Many others would meet a similar unexpected ending at the hands of this serial killer before he would be captured and brought to justice. Before 1978 was done, the notorious individual would claim another life after Mary Frances Bennett was attacked in October with a bladed weapon. Though long suspected to be his doing, the worst was not officially confirmed until 2012, when DNA evidence showed the trailside killer was the criminal responsible. 1980 was an especially active year for the serial killer, as six more lives were claimed. During the first three of these incidents, he was caught by an unsuspecting female jogger 
as he was in the middle of attacking another woman named Barbara Schwartz. He didn't know that he'd been spotted at the time, and she ran to get police. By the time they returned, the serial killer had already disappeared. November 28th of that year was a dark and disturbing day. Four missing bodies were discovered. Diane O'Connell was hiking in Point Reyes National Park. She separated from two other hikers while heading down the trail. And when she didn't arrive at the meetup point, her friends began to search. While looking for the missing hiker, her friends stumbled across terrifying crime scene evidence. The human remains of Richard Stowes and Cynthia Moreland, a young couple who had gone missing while hiking the previous month, were found. Later, the search party found the body of Diane alongside that of Shauna May, two women who didn't know one another. Investigators determined one had probably stumbled across the serial killer while he was attacking the other. In 1981, the serial killer struck twice more, but these final crimes would be his undoing. In March, he fired upon Ellen Hansen and Steve Hurdle, and Steve managed to survive to give police a clear description of the serial killer in question. The final life claimed was Heather Skaggs, who was different from the others because she knew the notorious individual. Heather worked at a print shop in Hayward, California. In April, one of her co-workers named David Carpenter told her of a car his friend had for sale. Known as a creep and a loner, who had already been to prison multiple times, David Carpenter had already attempted to take the life of Lois D'Andrade back in 1960 and had served seven years in prison. He also served another seven years for criminal kidnapping. Despite these real-life horror stories, Carpenter somehow managed to convince Heather to go with him to see this car. On May 1st, she made her boyfriend aware of her plans before she left. When she didn't return home, he immediately knew who to suspect. Heather's missing body was found by hikers 23 days later, at which point Carpenter was arrested in July. In two separate trials, he was found guilty of taking the lives of seven people and is suspected of having many more victims. He spent the rest of his life behind bars. Number 3. Stoff van Aken was born in 1951 in Belgium. He came from a poor family, and his father had a drinking habit and would get physical with the family. The elder van Aken abandoned his family after becoming a killer himself, but home life didn't get any better for those he left behind. Van Aken committed a number of crimes as a teenager and was institutionalized for a time before completing his military service at age 18. It was shortly after when he took the life of his first victim. Marie-Therese Rossiel was just 18 years old when she was attacked in October of 1971. A maid for a textile baron, she was on duty when Van Aken spied her peeling potatoes and attacked. When she was found, Mary Therese had defensive marks, showing she had struggled against her attacker. She also had teeth marks on her chest, which earned Aiken his vampire moniker. 47-year-old Ida Smeets was the next to face the serial killer's wrath. Despite the age difference, the bite marks convinced officers the same person was responsible for both unsolved crimes. Ida had been dragged to an abandoned factory before Van Aken put his hands around her throat, and then he went home to clean up and eat. He returned to the crime scene later that night, only to find her still alive, much to his surprise, and so he made certain that she would tell no one. Ludgard van der Welt was the final woman to encounter the serial killer before he was finally caught and brought to justice. Van Aken had slightly more of a connection to Ludgard and the previous two victims, as he was seen dancing with her at a club shortly before the crime. Ludgard's body was found in a similar fashion to the other two victims, teeth marks and all. Not long after Ludgard's missing body was found, an investigator combed the crime scene and Van Aken cycled past. Maybe he had returned to the crime scene to make sure nobody was alive or for some other morbid reason. But whatever the case may be, Crime scene investigators believed he was acting suspiciously and took the serial killer in for an interview where he made a criminal confession. While recalling his various horror stories, he said he needed to be locked up 
and told of many other failed attempts in which women had survived. He spent the rest of his life behind bars, and as one of the self-admitted worst individuals in existence, notoriously, he believed he was the most evil and should never be free. Number 2 Leonardo Cianciulli is sometimes called Italy's first female serial killer. She is definitely every bit as disturbing as the more famous serial killers well known throughout history. Cianciulli's worst crimes took place between 1939 and 1940. As the Second World War ravaged Italy, she earned a little money from each of her victims, though it was actually the war that motivated her most evil crimes as a serial killer. Born in 1894, Cianciulli had a difficult upbringing and developed mental disorders all of her life. When she fell in love and married a registry office clerk named Raphael Pansardi, her parents didn't approve of the marriage, and her mother allegedly cursed her, which deeply affected her perceived mental state even further. For the next few years, she experienced legal troubles, an earthquake, and getting pregnant no less than 17 times, with only four of her children ever reaching adulthood. Her mother's curse was coming true, as was later confirmed to her in a prophecy of a fortune teller. She had fallen in the habit of having her fortune read. One teller said that she would have several children, but all would pass away young. Because of this and the early tragedies, she was very overprotective of her surviving children, especially her oldest son, Giuseppe. When the Second World War started and Giuseppe told her he was enlisting in the army, she felt she needed to do something to protect him. Cianciulli believed that taking the lives of others would protect her son. Faustina Setti, a woman who came to Cianciulli looking for help finding a husband, was chosen for her most evil plans. Cianciulli convinced her to secretly elope with a man from a neighboring town and to write letters to her family before she left explaining what she had done. But on the day that she was set to leave, Cianciulli poisoned her wine and then took Faustina's life with an axe. She baked crunchy cakes with her human remains, which were served to guests, and disposed of the rest of the evidence with caustic cleaning agents. Next, someone came to her for help finding a job in a neighboring town. Again, Cianciulli convinced her to leave town and write postcards to her family to explain her disappearance. Again, the serial killer followed her most notoriously evil routine of the poisoned wine followed by an axe. Cianciulli's third and final target was Virginia Cacioppo, who wanted help finding a job in the big city. Cianciulli claimed to work as a secretary, then used her wine and axe method for a third time. Not only did the serial killer make cakes from human remains, but also used Virginia's body to make soap, which she gave as gifts to neighbors. It earned her the nickname, The Soap Maker. But unlike the other two murder cases, Virginia had close family who didn't believe the disappearance story. She also had been spotted going into Chunchuli's house just before she mysteriously vanished without a trace. At first, Chunchuli denied any part in the unsolved disappearances. When police believed that her son, Giuseppe, was the real serial killer, this prompted Chunchuli to make a criminal confession. She went into details about how she had taken the lives of her victims, and even wrote a memoir in prison. Giuseppe and his father were interviewed by crime investigators for possibly assisting Chanchuli in her serial killer crimes, but eventually they were found to have no part in the case. Chanchuli spent 30 years in prison and three years in a criminal asylum before passing away. Number 1 more than a decade before the likes of Jeffrey Dahmer, Australia had its very own twisted serial killer who hunted men in East Sydney. He was compared to Jack the Ripper and took the lives of five men before he was finally caught. On June 4, 1961, the body of Alfred Greenfield was discovered in a toilet block at a local pool. The crime scene entailed a highly disturbing use of a blade. Five months later, Ernest Cobbin would be found similarly in another toilet block. After this second crime, police were certain they were looking for a serial killer. There were no witnesses to either crime and no evidence that could point them in the direction of the criminal. 
Before they could make any progress in the case, the serial killer struck again. It was March 31, 1962, and a couple with a young child were walking through the suburbs of Darlinghurst late at night when they spotted a man lying in the road. Frank McLean had been struck several times over with a blade, but was still alive when the couple found him. By the time police arrived 45 minutes later, Frank had been dragged to a different street. Investigators reasoned that the serial killer had been disturbed by the couple, but come out to finish the job when they went to fetch police. After this third crime, police tried to lure out the serial killer. Since all three victims had been drinking and police set up similar decoys for the criminal to target, it seemed that the serial killer had stopped. In April of 1963, a Sydney postal worker bumped into a former co-worker who he knew as Alan Brennan. This story had to be impossible because Alan's body had been found last year. When Alan's former co-worker tried to tell police he was still alive, the story was dismissed as false. Everyone knew that after getting fired from his postal job, Alan had set up his own store selling sandwiches and small goods, only to disappear in November of 1962. Passers-by noticed a strange smell coming from the shop. When police were called in to investigate, they found a body hidden beneath the floorboards in such a bad condition that the person couldn't be identified. It was ruled that the body was Alan and that he had passed due to natural causes. The unsolved mystery as to how he ended up under the floorboards was never made clear. The press picked up the story and with pressure from the public, police exhumed the body of the man they assumed to be Alan Brennan. Fingerprints identified the man as Patrick Hackett, a thief who'd been released from prison in June and promptly disappeared. What's more, a closer inspection found that he had a bladed weapon used on him in a way that matched the infamous serial killer. Alan Brennan's photo was circulated and he was eventually tracked down in Melbourne, working under a different name. The criminal known as Alan Brennan confessed to being William MacDonald, an Englishman who had moved to Australia years earlier. He also confessed to being the infamous serial killer responsible for taking the lives of at least five people. Despite confessing, MacDonald pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but was found guilty at trial. He spent the rest of his life behind bars, eventually passing away at the age of 90. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.